All right, so this is part two of the rise of nation states notes. Um, we're going to talk about France now, and then the Hundred Years' War. All right, France began, as you already know, under the Frankish kingdoms led by Charlemagne, who is the most important um, Frankish ruler under the Carolingian Empire. So after he dies, we see a patchwork of feudal manners, like the little teeny tiny kingdoms fighting for control. By 987, the, uh, a guy named Hugh Capet is elected to the throne by these, uh, by the feudal nobility uh, that make up modern day France. And when he does that, he establishes a new dynasty that we call the Capetian dynasty. The Capetian dynasty expands control and they, they, they establish uh, authority across over, you know, modern day France that we know as France today. Um, and the Capetian dynasty has the power to appoint lo loyal officials to the crown and they also won the right to exclusive, exclusively make coins so they control trade and the, and the monetary policy in France and the ability to wage war. So this puts all of the nobles who used to fight each other against, you know, that's my set of woods, or no, that's my fishing spot, um, all their little minor issues to bed because they could not legally wage war. If they did, they would suffer and most likely lose their territory to the king. So, Moving on to the Hundred Years' War. This war is misnamed because we call it the Hundred Years' War, but it actually lasts for over a hundred years, from 1337 to 1453. Now you may say, Ms. Kimmick, can't, uh, can uh, historians add? And I would say the answer would be no. But it lasted so long that, you know, well over a hundred years, it has a nickname, Hundred Years' War. And it's predominantly between England versus France. Um, and this has to go back to the issue of who owns France, because the kings of England claimed land in France, because if you recall, William the Conqueror was actually a French, like, duke. Uh, he owned, you know, like, northern France, Normandy. And when France, when the French king dies without a son, similar to the problem with, um, in England, leading to the Norman invasion, England claims the French crown. In the Hundred Years' War, it's also important to note that it is not 114 years of pitched warfare every single year, like you would think the U.S. Civil War or World War I or World War II. It's periodic conflicts, so, you know, couple of years a king is gonna in, invade and have a battle and then nothing would happen for seven ten years and then another thing happens so it's it's periodic it's off and on for the most part of the hundred years war England was winning because they had a superior military technology mainly the long bow and the long bow is is just a simple cro cross um bow and arrow you know Katniss Everdeen but it's much much bigger it's like five feet tall and if you think about it the bigger the bow the stronger um the uh, pull and the faster that arrow is going to reach its target um, so the longbows are like, um, you know, the cannons of, you know, before gunpowder is around. Um, they have a much more um, probability of penetrating the plate or the steel armor that the knights would be wearing. Very, very effective. So here we have a set of four maps. And at the beginning of the war, at the very top, 1337, you have the French holdings, and England only contains a little teeny tiny um, part of the land in southwest France, okay, an area called Gascony and Aquitaine. By 1360, after a battle called Poitiers, um, they, the English have now expanded to um, most of southwestern France. They now um, 
uh, they gain all of Aquitaine and all of Gascony, and now they're, you know, uh, making their way uh, towards Italy. The high point would be in 1429, um, where the, well, by now the English have lost the area, the gains that they made in 1360, but if you look, green, um, it, they've regained all the area of Normandy that they once controlled under William the Conqueror, Brittany, like half of France, um, the northern part of France. And by the end of the war, the French have now kicked out the entire, kicked out the English fully, um, and, and they're going to win the, win the war. Couple key battles. The first one is the English, great English victory at the Battle of Agincourt. Agincourt happens in 415, and this is where you have like a David versus Goliath moment. But it's the English who's David, and the French have a massive troops of 50,000 Frenchmen strong. And it looked for a while that the English were going to lose, but they don't. And this is because they only lose about 500 men, and that's because they use a new technology, the longbow. Um, and they were able to, they're standing on a hillside, um, and the English archers which is able to rain down arrow after arrow against the French army who are all on horses, and they're also fighting in like uh, mud pits because it just rained a couple days, and the French lose 8,000 um, Knights, and this was a huge loss for them, uh, kind of a demoralizing low point for the French. The woman who will save and lead France to victory is, of course, Joan of Arc. Joan of Arc was a poor peasant girl, uneducated, uh, you know, just living in rural France, who received a mission from God to, quote, save France from the English. She, she received messages from two saints plus Michael the Archangel. Um, and she goes to the French, um, the French uh, prince who is claiming to be the French king. And she says, look, these revelations are true. He believes her. He gives her an army. And she does win a couple of key battles um, before she is injured. Um, she led them to victory at Orléans in 1429 and allows the French king, sorry, the France, French prince to be crowned king of France for the first time in like a hundred years. However, her downfall, she's going to be betrayed and she, she's wounded and she's betrayed and she's captured by a group of people called the Burgundians. You don't need to know that, but she's given over to the English and the English put her on this big trial and they um, they eventually find her guilty for witchcraft and heresy and she's burned at the stake however after even after her death she really is important because she inspires the french to drive the english out of, of france once and for all um and later on uh in the in the, in the 20th century like 1920s joan of arc will um become a saint, uh, named a saint by the Pope. Last part, the effects of the Hundred Years' War. This is, the Hundred Years' War definitely plays a development of nationalism for both France and England. So, effects, development of nationalism. It leads to a decline in feudalism, because now we're seeing more loyalty, not to your, not to your lord, or not from the vassal to the lord, but to the king instead. We see an increase of population of towns, so the number of towns that actually increase both in France and England. And finally we see a development of a new middle class. And the new middle class is important because they're going to be the ones who pay the taxes to um, you know, pay the armies for their service. Um, so those are the four effects and that's it for your notes about the, uh, the Hundred Years' War. Hope you guys have a good day.